morning and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd and we've got another great show planned for you tonight, including answering all your gardening questions. We still are not taking any calls at the moment, but you can still submit those questions for a future show. Send us an email to byf at unl.edu. Do tell us where you live and as much as you can about your question. A few pictures also helps us give you the best answer. You can also keep up with Backyard Farmer during the week on our social media channels, YouTube and Facebook. Let's get things going with a few samples. We're going to welcome Kate for her very first debut show, sitting in the bug chair, and she has some very cool bug chair samples. Thank you. So a lot of people are noticing these kind of odd looking formations. Maybe they're outside doing some garden cleanup or in their lawn or maybe even finding these stuck to the side of their house. So these are actually praying mantis oothica or egg cases. Here in Nebraska, we have two different common species of praying mantises. We have the native Carolina mantis, which makes kind of this smaller oothica or egg case. And then we have the much larger Chinese mantis, which makes this large one um, kind of globular in shape. So out of each of these egg cases, there's going to hatch up to 200 praying mantis babies. And that's gonna be happening sometime in May, maybe into early June. Um, most of those will not make it to adulthood, but um, those that do, we usually don't see until about late into the summer, early into fall. And when we do see them, these are examples of the Chinese mantis here. Um, the Chinese mantis are the large ones that we see. They're really cool and beautiful looking and they can get up to three to four inches long. And if you do find these egg cases in your yard, we recommend just letting them be. Praying mantises we consider beneficial because they're predators and they could potentially eat pests. That being said, they are generalists, so they're just as likely to eat a pollinator as they would be a pest and probably likely to eat each other as well. And do not pluck one of those off by accident and leave it in your car because then you have baby mantises all over your car. Well, at least no insects in there, though, right? Well, this is I'll true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kyle, uh, several rots and spots. Nice. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of a lot of trees are starting to to leaf out. But if your yard is looking at all like mine, there are certain trees where some of those branches just aren't doing much of anything yet. And we always say, oh, you want to follow that branch down and look for a canker. Well, what what is a canker? And so I kind of brought sh canker show and tell tonight. Um, we have three different types of canker on three different uh, three different hosts here, and so the first one that I'll show is this is hypoxalon canker. Uh, there we go um, on a bur oak, and so hypoxalon canker, one of our most common cankers um, here in Nebraska, affects most of our hardwoods, but really loves oaks. And this black um, stro uh, stromata is one of, the, one of the distinguishing factors of it. And eventually, um, as this stromata ages, and so this is actually the fruiting body of the fungus, um, as it ages, it may get a kind of silvery appearance, something like that. But this canker tends to be favored by drought conditions hmm. or if the tree is overwatered. So really stress, um, some sort of moisture stress is what hypoxalon canker tends to favor. The next one um, here is, uh, is a nectria canker, and this is on, I think, an elm, um, but we have these kind of orange fruiting structures that are erupting through the, erupting through the bark surface. And so we don't have any, any large divots or anything like that in the, um, in the branch or in the trunk that we're able to see, but these orange structures are one of the telltale signs of nectria canker. And just like hypoxalon, this one is favored by environmental stresses. Um, and the next one that I'll show is, this is a honey locust, and this is thyronectria canker, and so kind of a cousin to, to the other one. But if we zoom in on the crotch um, here, the, uh, we can see these black, um, there we go, um, the, the black sporodokia that are erupting through. And in this case, it's actually really difficult to see, um, to see thyronectria canker unless you start to peel back some of, the, some of the bark. 
So we did have to tear back the bark on this one to actually have these have these show up. So cankers can be a little bit difficult to um, a little bit difficult to identify unless you are willing to willing to really kind of tear some of that bark 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 away, go out with the chisel or something like that. As far as control, fungicides will not work for any of these or really any of our cankers. Um, they will continue to fruit and produce spores anytime environmental conditions are adequate. And so um, we're, not, we're not able to time those fungicide applications, which means you will just be wasting your, wasting your time and money if you try to, try to use a fungicide on these. And so pruning is really going to be your best bet. But when you are pruning, you want to make sure that you're pruning down at least six to eight inches below where, that, below where you see that canker, just to make sure that you're getting as much of that fungal pathogen as possible. Excellent and kind of unfortunate. It, it is, they're, uh, but you know, they're uh, just a part of tree life, unfortunately. <laughs> all right, Elizabeth, you have some beauty to make up for all of Kyle's rots and spots. I do, I have the, uh, a uh, good, pretty looking sample of the evening, I think. Um, what I have is I have a sample off of one of the shrubs outside of the station here. And what it is, is it's a Regent service berry, also known as a Juneberry. And they are just covered in blooms right now. And it's just amazing to see them all in bloom um, in this large mass. And so with service berries, there's several different um, species out there. This happens to be the one that gets about three to six foot tall. Now there are some other ones that have gotten a little larger, let's say 10 foot, but it took like 35 years to get there. But this is one that if you like blueberries, you will love the berries off of here because the berries that follow these flowers show up in June and they rival that of blueberries. Um, you need to be out there before the birds get a chance to get them if you wanna eat them. Um, but this is one of the service berries um, that'll grow well, really drought resistant, full sun to part shade. Um, not a lot of pests. We have had some issues with rabbits and we've had issues with fire blight in some of our samples in Grand Island, but for the most part, a really hardy shrub that does well, multiple seasons of interest. You got the early spring bloom and then we have the berry and then we're gonna have that, that fall color uh, that follows it. So it's one for the landscape that's gonna go all year long. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. All right, Kate, baptism, here's your first picture question. Uh, this is a viewer who uh, lives in the country club neighborhood of Lincoln and has red twig dogwood. He's wondering if this is okay or some kind of a scale. He did say he couldn't pick it off with his thumbnail, but of course that doesn't necessarily mean anything. So what do you think? Yeah, so it's a little bit difficult to tell in the picture. Um, a lot of the stems look like just regular dogwood. You might be referring to that one kind of in the mid right where there's a kind of a gray mass on there. It could potentially be oyster scale. Um, I would take the rough side of a sponge and kind of really scrub at it to see if you can get scales off of there. If you do suspect that it's scale, um, Mid, late May would be the time to monitor for egg hatch and crawlers. So if you think it's scale, take a piece of double-sided tape, tape it around one of those stems and really monitor throughout May to see if any crawlers come out and you get insects in that. If you do, that is the exact time that you need to apply um, a pyrethroid insecticide like bifenthrin or permethrin because the crawlers are gonna be the most susceptible to treatment. Excellent, and your next question is uh, from Fremont. And she says these tiny insects were swarming under her composter when she turned it over. She wonders what they are. Are they good guys or are they bad guys? Yeah, so these are good guys. They're called minute black scavenger flies. And just as their name implies, they're um, associated with decomposing organic matter. So they're probably helping out that composting process for you. Excellent. Thank you, Kate. All right, Kyle, um, you have three different pictures. Mm -hmm from two different viewers of concolor fir. The first two are from Blair. They cut some branches out of the concolor fir this winter. They line the west side of the house, 25 feet tall. Um, we've, we've looked at this one before mm -hmm. for 
a particular fungus and you don't think it had that one. So, and then your, let's look at your third picture as long as we're looking here and that, this is a different viewer. This is uh, in Lincoln, this one's 21 year old. Mm -hmm. And last year it started to thin toward the middle to the top north side is now brown and it is on the north side of their house but clearly it's in full sun mm -hmm. yeah um you know unfortunately we i've seen a lot of white furs con color furs that have been showing very similar symptoms to this over the over the past couple of weeks and now there are some there are some fungal pathogens that can cause similar injury to white fur um, one that we do worry about is delphinelia tip um, shoot blight that one can, um, the needles will, will die, but the base of the needles often, um, often remains green. However, um, frost injury, kind of winter, um, winter injury, has that very similar symptom as well. And I think that really all of these are, um, are abiotic, and so it's all environmental. We have had, it's been a rough couple of years for, for a lot of our trees, um, as, especially this past winter. It got cold um, early in the winter, early in the fall last year, then it warmed up and it got cold again, then it warmed up, then it got super, super cold. And then three days later, it was 70 degrees in Lincoln. Um, not ideal conditions for, for a lot of trees. And so I think what a lot of the injury that we're seeing is, um, you know, there's something Maybe there is some sort of injury or a canker that had that had formed down towards the base, um, towards the base of those branches, and then the the adverse weather conditions that we've been seeing were just kind of the death knell for for a lot of these branches. And now the other ones um, that had some of that blue coloration, um, almost that blue fungal looked like looked like a blue fungal growth out of it. That is, uh, yep, there we go. Um, that is most likely just one of our sap rots. And so it is a fungal pathogen that, that can cause that blue coloration, but it's not pathogenic. And so it is just growing saprophytically, feeding on the sap and causing that blue coloration. So just because you see that blue does not necessarily mean that the tree is destined to die. All right, thank you, Kyle. Elizabeth, boxwoods had a time. So we'll go through your three boxwoods sort of in order and you can talk about each one of these. Uh, the first is 27th and Van Dorn. She has uh, trimmed it, fertilized and watered it well. Now she's thinking of cutting it all down lower to 10 inches. What do you think? I don't think <clears throat> it's gonna help. Uh, boxwoods got hit hard this year. And as mm -hmm. you can see in this one, when it was hedged, um, normally we recommend removing all of the dead because it's mm -hmm. not going to bud back out again. But once you remove all of that dead, there's not going to be a lot left of that shrub. So your best bet is to probably consider removal, especially in those areas that seem to be the heaviest hit. And then possibly if you can find replacements with, with that hedge. All right, and then your second one is Omaha and uh, wants to know what to do about those winter damaged ones. Remove and replace. Um, we take out as much of the dead as we possibly can. At that point in time, you're left with one quarter of the shrub. It's not going to give you that nice round form that you're looking for. Um, mm -hmm. Your best bet's gonna be just remove and replace. And your third one is also Omaha. Uh, rough winter, do they need to just remove and start over or can they save by pruning? If they want to take the time and prune the dead out, they can to see what's left. It's hard to tell if there's anything alive underneath, but it, it's same song. I'm, I'm unfortunately going to probably recommend removal. All right. And then you have a fourth picture, I think, of a holly, if I'm not mistaken. And this one is a holly. Um, apparently, we don't have that one, so we'll save that one for a lightning round. Oh, sounds great. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, you know, we've been getting a number of questions about sticky mounds of pine on our pine trees. Unfortunately, if you see these, it's usually too late to do anything about it. The culprit is an insect. Here to tell us more is Caitlin Chapman. Over the years, we've received many photos of some odd looking growths on the bark of pine trees. 
While these may look like a fungus, it's actually the sign of a serious pest called the Zimmerman pine moth. And like many insect pests in our landscapes, correct timing is the key to proper management. Caterpillars or larvae of the Zimmerman pine moth tunnel underneath the bark of pine trees, particularly in the whorls where the branches meet the trunk. This causes the branches to become girdled, limb die off, deform growth, ultimately leading to weakened physical weakness in infested trees. While the Zimmerman pine moth can infest many different species of pine, Scotch and Austrian pines are particularly susceptible to injury. The most obvious sign of a Zimmerman pine moth infestation is the formation of these popcorn-like pitch or resin masses that occur when the caterpillar tunnels and starts feeding. The plant will start oozing sap and frass, leading to these soft, milky white to pinkish in color fresh masses. Masses from previous year's infestations will usually be hard to the touch, yellow to white in color, and or a dull gray. The only way to effectively manage the Zimmerman pine moth is to treat your trees when the caterpillars are outside of the bark and therefore susceptible to insecticides. Caterpillars overwinter underneath the bark, but during mid-April to early May, they'll exit their hibernaculum to begin actively feeding, therefore they're outside of the bark and susceptible to insecticide treatment. This makes it our first treatment window. Caterpillars will then find a new feeding site, go back under the protection of the bark, and form pitch masses, staying there until they pupate around mid-July. The only other time where you can treat your trees is when eggs begin hatching around August. If you suspect that you have a Zimmerman pine moth infestation, you should treat your trees with an insecticidal spray containing the active ingredients bifenthrin or permethrin. Trees should be treated from the top down and drenched almost to the point of runoff, but remember to always read and follow the pesticide label instructions. If you have pine trees in your yard, monitor for pitch masses, and remember the A months, April and August for treatment to keep your pine trees healthy. So that window is open right now to make sure those pines are healthy throughout the growing season. And we wanna give a special thanks to Jody for some of the pictures we saw in this feature because we could not find those pitch masses. <laughs> All right, so Caitlin, your next questions here. Uh, this is an Omaha viewer, they have a bunch of bugs on their grill cover and window screens. They're all different sizes, maybe half an inch long. They want to know what it is, and they're a little worried about it with small children. Yeah, so these may look like mosquitoes, but they're actually aquatic, non-biting midges. So they're associated with water in their lar larval form, excuse me, just like mosquitoes are, but the adults, when they emerge, which happens to be in mass most of the time, I'm sure as you're experiencing, um, they feed on nectar or they don't feed and they're completely harmless to us. They're just kind of more of a nuisance. They are, however, attracted to lights. So my recommendation is keep your porch light off at night. Make sure your blinds are closed to limit as much light as you can. Um, like I said, they're harmless. So if they're really annoying, you can get out the leaf blower, blow them away maybe. But <laughs> really, that's um, as far as my recommendation goes. All right. Thanks, Kate. And then you have a Lincoln viewer who... Uh has been using this to get rid of the next picture, which is, of course, the ants. And she wants, she, she's apparently real frustrated with it. She can't, she can't get rid of them, and she's wondering what else she could use. Yeah, so you're on the right track using bait stations. Um, it's hard to tell from the picture, but it looks like it could be an odorous house ant. So I would recommend, um, first and foremost, that bait stations, they take time. You know, the ants need to feed from it and then leave and then take it back to their nest or colony, which most of the time is outside. So it's not an instant fix. You know, it takes a couple days to a couple of weeks for the bait stations to really take effect. Two is that odorous house ants, they're really hungry ants. They eat a lot, so make sure those bait stations are filled and replaced when they need to be. And three, think about the placement of where those bait stations are. So from the picture, it looks like it might have been on the floor right next to a baseboard. Is that where you're seeing the ants coming from or can you follow them to perhaps the area where they're entering into the house? I would relocate the bait station there or even better yet, if you see them outside, you can put it outside your home and that might deter them from coming in as well. All right, excellent, thanks Kate. All right, Kyle, this is a Wahoo viewer. He sent a lot of pictures of a fungus that is growing just beneath the surface of his turf. 
He says it's feeding on the leftover roots of a large tree that was removed about a few years before he mm -hmm. bought the house. Good descriptions here. It's really hard. He pulled out a whole bunch of pictures and all the turf has died. And <laughs> they had about a 10 by 10 acre, uh, or acre, 10 by 10 square foot area covered. And almost all of that turf has died there. He wants to know, is this still f a fungus under there? What can he do about it? And is he going to be able to get turf reestablished in this spot? Yeah, so um, establishment of turf in that spot may be a little bit difficult until the, until the wood has decomposed that, that this fungus is growing on. Um, unfortunately, difficult to, to give, a, um, to give a, an accurate ID on, um, on this from the, from the pictures. Things are a little bit blurry and there's not a whole lot of descriptive features in, um, included here. However, um, it may be a fungus kind of in the, uh, in the, Maripil the Maripilaceae family. Um, and those are, they, they will feed on um, rotting wood. And every time it rains and there's a lot of moisture, they will refruit and form, form new fungal masses. So what you can do is just keep on removing that um, time after time, and you will, not, you will cut down on the amount of fungal inoculum in the, uh, in the lawn. But until, the, until that wood has completely decomposed, it's probably going to keep coming back. All right, and then you have a, another picture, I think, here that mm -hmm. is, uh, this is a Hastings viewer. He wonders, is there a way to control or get rid of these? They're in an area where a large pin oak was cut down about five years ago. And so that's the exact same thing. Um, until, the, until those roots have, have degraded, these mushrooms will likely keep coming back, especially if we continue to have as much moisture as, as we've had this spring. Um, it was difficult to get an ID on, on these mushrooms, um, but when I zoomed in, I know they had kind of large caps that were overlapping, so I wonder if they're not honey mushrooms um, or armillaria mushrooms. Um, they are, um, that have colonized the, the oak roots. Best way to get rid of mushrooms in a lawn, um, if, or if you, I would say just wait them out, um, they will disappear and they're just kind of fun to look at. But if you need to get rid of them, um, applying fertilizer can help stimulate the turf roots, which will help break down that, um, that woody material a little bit faster. So fertilizer is about your best bet. Um, otherwise, just going out and, and um, trying to pick those mushrooms out is about all you can do. Yep, we're saying either golf club or swing that foot. Have it's, a little, hey, play a little soccer. Yeah, golf clubs would be great for that. <laughs> all right, Elizabeth, you have a couple of identification pictures here. The first is uh, from Omaha. Will you please help me identify this beautiful flowering shrub? I would love to, because this is one of my favorite shrubs. Mm -hmm. um, that's probably the Korean spice viburnum. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of different viburnums, but they have a very pleasant clove scent to the flowers, and that's why it's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And it's a set it for, and forget it, pretty mm -hmm. much. And it's hardy, and you don't have to do much with the viburnum. Exactly, and then you have a viewer here that recently moved to West Point. Uh, she found these on the east side of her house. Can we identify them? You bet we can. So they are very lucky. Um, what they is is it's a rhododendron, probably the PJM um, cultivar, and those are one of the hardy ones for Nebraska. It is a broadleaf evergreen, so I'm kind of surprised it doesn't have any winter damage. Um, but that is something to keep in mind down the road is you need to make sure with those broadleaf evergreens that we don't have that winter desiccation damage with them. Excellent. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, if anyone doubts that you live in Nebraska, our weather patterns have been super cold, hot, back to cold, hot, cold, hot, <laughs> cold. <laughs> but our garden tulips are putting on a show and our other ornamentals are doing just fine. Here's Terry James from the Backyard Farmer Garden to show us more. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're seeing some beautiful flowers emerge. Our red and white tulips are in beautiful flower this year. They're three or four years old, so not as many as there had been when we first planted them, but they're still really showing off their true Husker colors. 
We also have curry and spice by Burnham. As you walk by it, that heavenly scent is so perfumey. It just is a wonderful addition um, to the spring garden. We also have some phlox and other things that are blooming. We did plant some of our containers. So a couple containers have some beautiful pansies. Those pansies are super hardy and really nothing's gonna, they're just gonna laugh at some of those cooler temperatures that we have coming later this week. And finally, we have our asparagus coming up. Just about time to start picking some of that. So maybe we'll have a little bit of grilled asparagus um, for dinner in a couple days. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check it out. And of course, we're still waiting to make sure that the cold snap doesn't hang on before we plant all of those plants that really don't like those cold soil temps. So stay tuned. Do not put peppers and tomatoes in the, in the ground just yet. All right, Kate, we have time for one question, uh, I think before the break. This is a viewer that has been starting seedlings in her basement for several years. She's used lights. She had some insects take over last year. Last year it was fungus gnats. She had a fungus on the tomatoes. This year, now she had aphids. Now she has tiny black bugs. She's tried all sorts of things, miticides, fungicides, insecticides, garden sprays, eight, dust. She's wondering what to do at this point. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> um, aphids and what might, the black dots might be signs of spider mites, which are kind of the bane of my existence, having worked in greenhouses before. Unfortunately, you might just be at the point where you need to start over um, and make sure when you start over that everything's clean because if it is spider mites, they tend to stay on pots and yeah. So I know that's not probably the answer you're looking for, but that might be the best bet at this point. And, and since she can't take those tomatoes and peppers outside unless she tents maybe, or in out, or in out, in out. Again. Um, so I'm not sure on this one. Because I mean, we're gonna get down to like 26 yeah. next week, so they really can't take it outside, but maybe like a sample or trying to get a photo yeah. might help. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So we could see, if, especially if she intends to continue to try to grow mm -hmm. plants under lights in the basement, which an awful lot of people do. And mm -hmm. once you get those critters and creatures in there, as yeah. you say, it's pretty tricky. Right now it is time for the lightning round. Elizabeth, are you ready? I'm ready. So your first one here is from David City. She says her daffodils have very small flowers. She's wondering if she can dig and divide them, and if she does that, will the flowers get bigger? It makes me wonder if they let them stand long enough over the, the summer and fall to recharge those bulbs. I'd wait and see what, how that goes, and then this fall, if you need to dig them up and move them, you can do that. All right, uh, we have several people wondering whether they can use just regular old farm soil in raised beds. No. All right. We have a Denison, Iowa viewer who wonders, is, are there good sources for the plastic rain barrels um, to, to use as a rain barrel? There are lots of resources out there. You can order them um, online in different places. Just make sure if you make one yourself that it's a food grade barrel. All right. Excellent. Uh, we have a Sergeant Bluff viewer who has a six-year-old and a one-year-old autumn blaze maple. He's wondering whether he should fertilize them and should he use fertilizer spikes? Nope, we do not fertilize trees. They don't need it. All right, what happens if you haven't cut back your ornamental grasses by now? You're going to want to. Um, just be careful <laughs> that you don't cut too much of the alive stuff off. All right, excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Kyle, you ready? Born ready. Born ready. All right, your first one, uh, this viewer is wondering whether it is possible to buy tomato plants that are resistant to the fungus that we had last year. Um, yes, it's most likely possible, but it also depends on what, what that fungus is. Um, but yeah, um, most likely you can find resistant varieties out there. All right, we have a viewer who wants to know when to treat for peach leaf curl. Uh, pass. <laughs> All right, we have a Mason City viewer who says their spruce is dying from the inside out. What might that be? Um, could easily be one of our um, 
one of our uh, needle cast, either rhizosphera or stigmina. If you are thinking about control, um, you want to, that's going to be two, two fungicide applications. The first one when the needles are about half, um, half elongated, and the second one about four to five weeks later when those needles have fully elongated. All right, we have a rumor that somebody has been finding morels near Omaha. All right, have they gone back underground because now it's gotten cold again? Uh, probably, <laughs> but the fact that cedar apple galls are out, um, morels are probably out as well. All right, excellent. We're not telling where we find them either, are we? Nope, no one ever does. All right, Kate, your first lightning round, you ready? Yes. This is a Fort Calhoun viewer who wonders what is the most effective and environmentally friendly treatment for grubs in the lawn. They're worried about children and pets. So unfortunately, the most environmentally friendly is not gonna be the most effective. Um, we recommend doing yeah, imidacloprid and halfazide sometime in June. All right, uh, when do you treat for oyster shell scale on maple? It was really devastating last year. Yeah, so I, I mentioned earlier oyster shell scale, um, you need to treat when it's in that crawler stage and that's going to be happening, hatch is gonna happen in late May. So um, when that happens, yeah, use your insecticides. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, we had this question I think earlier and we got it again from a different viewer, stink bugs infesting the house. What do we do about stink bugs right now? Stink bugs infesting the house, the easiest thing you can do is just vacuum them up. Um, you can do perimeter treatments in your house in the fall, but stink bugs can fly, so it's only gonna be so effective. All right, we have a lot of fruit trees flowering right now, and our viewers are wondering, will the, this cold snap affect the pollinators and therefore the fruit? The short answer is yes. They're gonna get out of sync a little bit. Perfect, all right, very nice job, all. Elizabeth, plants of the week. Yes, we have three very lovely plants of the week this week. And so we're gonna start with the white one in front. What it is is it's a spring snow wagelia. Um, this is one of the bigger wagelias, but it is also one that doesn't have the dieback to it. So it's a really nice one. It's got a true white flower on it, um, and it's got that trumpet shape um, to them. So these are just really blooming right now. Um, a really nice one. The next one we're gonna go to is our lovely bleeding heart. This is one of the old fashioned plants, does really well in shaded environments. It does go summer dormant. So don't worry if it looks good in the spring and then all of a sudden you can't find it. Um, it can seed itself, so be ready to find seedlings around. There is a white one, there's some light pink ones, some, there's several different cultivars out there. And then the last one to round out is going to be my favorite, the Korean spice viburnum. Um, the reason I like this is because it's a smaller one. Now there are two larger ones. There's the Judd and the Berkwoody Eye, and both of them have the same clove scent and the same kind of flower to them, the little like pom-pom on there. They're just bigger shrubs. So depending on the spot that you have, if you've got that part shade environment, um, you can pick from either one of the three that smell amazing in our early spring bloomers when it comes to those viburnums. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. And they smell so I know, good. I don't wanna move them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kate, um, this is actually from campus. So these questions came from campus. This is in the Kime Courtyard, a regal privet and a birch leaf spirea. They've shown small leaves and some cane dieback for a couple of years. Canes were taken out a couple weeks ago. They broke off showing this at the base. The question is, is this termites? How did they get into the shrubs in that sort of a space and how to get rid of them. I actually love these pictures. I think that's kind of cool <laughs> from an entomology standpoint, you know. Um, so yes, those are termites and um, they're subterranean termites and as their name implies, they are soil dwelling so that they've probably been in the soil for a long time and just have gone unnoticed because they're soft bodied. So when they're out in the open like this, they can desiccate and dry out really easily. Um, as far as them being in the the plant, so it's likely that the, the plant had a lot of environmental stress already, so maybe the pith was dead and the termites just took advantage of that, because most of the time we see these termites 
eating dead wood rather than live wood. Um, could be the other way around, it's hard telling. That being said, we strongly recommend contacting a professional to get an inspection done. You know, you can use um, bait stations in the ground with, you know, toxicants labeled for termites. But since this one, this colony is out in the open, you know, you can do a direct spray on them too for, yeah. And just, and, and I think there was a question about whether termites can go way up a tree. Was that from you, Elizabeth, off air? That was. I, I've yeah. got a branch and a tree that's hanging down and the frass is packed in there and I didn't look close enough to see what it was, but. Send in a sample. I'm sending a sample. I should have brought one. <laughs> All right. Kyle, you have uh, your first two pictures are really strange and your wood just fell over. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is Bleeding Heart. So it's a, it's a large, he's calling it a fibrous tuber-like root on these bleeding hearts. And he wonders what to do about that. What, what is that, do you think? Well, it is fascinating. No. Um, <clears throat> ha, ha, ha. It's, I would, uh, that, to me, that looks like fasciation. Mm -hmm. um, so fascinating fasciation. It's one of the weird things that, that can happen when, um, especially when we have a cold snap and the plants are trying to actively grow and then it gets cold and cell function gets a little wonky and they don't exactly grow the way they are supposed to. Um, so if you really want to get rid of it, I would just, um, just prune it out. Probably won't come back though. So if you like seeing that, I would just leave it. It's, yeah, that's really weird. I don't know that I've ever seen it in Bleeding Heart. Uh -uh. Yeah. All right, and your next one is, um, an Omaha viewer sent this picture. It's on a branch of the choke cherry that they pruned off. What is this? That is black knot. Um, so very common on a lot of our um, a lot of our stone fruit trees. So plums, cherries as well. Pruning is the, one of the best ways to control it. However, we can also get these knots that form on the trunk. And so if that occurs, you can even just grab a paint chisel and kind of chisel them off. But you'll want to make sure that you're um, removing removing everything when you when you chisel them off. Similar to the cankers that I was talking about earlier, fungicides really are not effective for for black knot because it's a matter of timing. Anytime we have wet conditions and temperatures in the mid 50s to lower 70s, those spores can become active. Um, so. Best, best method to control these um, is pruning or removal of those knots. And then also um, trying to make sure that we're removing all of the volunteer stone fruits within about a 500 foot radius. Oh my goodness. Yeah, not gonna happen. Not though. gonna happen. <laughs> all right. Elizabeth, uh, this is three pictures from the same viewer. This is in Omaha. Uh, big magnolia. They just moved into it. They're not sure how old and what condition this is in. Uh, very close to the house, only half of it flowered, two major branches from the base, one has no buds, cankers at the bottom. Whew, the pruning on that was yeah. legend. Yeah. I, I think due to the multiple things that are not in that tree's favor, their best bet is going to be removal of that tree. Mm -hmm. um, the reason for that is it looks like one of those leaders did not flower. It looks like the other one of the leaders looks like it was topped off. Right. And then, like they said, it was really close to the house. So I think their best bet's going to be just to start over and make sure that it, they put the right plant in the right place and not try to make a tree fit in an area that a shrub should go. All right, excellent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, you know, we have not shown you our pond much lately, and it's really in need of a good cleaning. UNL research technician Josh Reznicek grabs the hose to give it a good scrubbing in tonight's second feature. Today we're in the courtyard, the Kime Hall courtyard, and we're gonna be doing some maintenance and upkeep of the pond behind me. Uh, it's been a couple years since we've been in here to do this, so it's gotten a little out of control for us, uh, but it's not too terrible yet. We have some algae growth and some plants that have overtaken. Uh, and we have to mind that we have some turtles in there still. So what we got going today is that we're gonna be draining the pond to power wash it to clean some of that algae off and then take care of our pondless feature down on the bottom here with raking out some of this leaf and material that's collected over the winter 
and then we're going to pull out some of that rock to get rid of some of the sediment that's collected down in the basin. Up top in the pond feature, like I said, we're going to drain that and then power wash it. We have to pull our turtles out first and then after we drain it, we'll power wash it from the bottom up so that way we can fill up some water as we go and then continue to drain it a couple times as we power wash it until we get done. So then we'll move up from there and go into our falls box and on the very top of the pond. And in there we have some screens and some bio balls that all need to be cleaned out and wash out to reduce sediment buildup and hopefully clear up some of this pond. And we'll do some rock setting as well, uh, just naturally, as well as some rocks getting kicked in. And even the turtles will knock some rocks down. We'll move some of that rocks back up onto the sidewalls to make it look more natural. Uh, and then after all that is done, we'll fill the pond up, washing all the rocks that we've power washed, and then we'll drain it a couple of times after that. Once we've done that, we'll fill it up. It's not gonna be crystal clear our first time filling it up, so it's gonna take a day or so to sediment, to settle out, and then it'll be a lot clearer, and those rocks will have that finish when we first installed it. So the reason we're doing this this year, and it should be done probably annually, is for the health of the wildlife in the pond, as well as for pond maintenance, helpful for the pumps, that we are not damaging the pumps uh, and the lines throughout the system. Uh, this should be done about once a year, ideally. Obviously, life can get in the way and it might be forgotten, and it can be done any time of year. We just like to do it in the spring. It's kind of one of the check boxes to start the year off, uh, but it can honestly be done any time of year. And as you've just seen, it really is a good idea to get out there at least now and certainly every year to clean up that pond. Leaving it just means a lot of a mess later, and that was that was definitely in need of that bath. All right, Kate, last questions for you. Um, the first one here is she's found these bees, bumbles. This is papillion. They were under a deck. She found uh, all three of these originally about 12 inches apart. She wondered if they came out early in the unseasonably warm weather the previous weekend and they just croaked or what, what happened here? Yeah, so these are actually not bumblebees. These are carpenter bees. They look really similar to bumblebees, but you can tell because their abdomens are shiny and bumblebees will be kind of hairy throughout their abdomen. And where you found them is pretty telling too. So carpenter bees, they do make their nests in wood. So I would take a good look under your deck, look for holes that are about um, the diameter of your pinky finger. And if you do find nests, they can cause some structural damage, so it might be a good idea to treat with a dust insecticide. And then the key to that is waiting about a week and then plugging that hole back up because bees will start reusing holes um, and that will just prevent future problems. You know, and we have not really had carpenter bees until two or three years ago as questions on air, so interesting. All right, your next one, uh, this is a viewer from Beatrice. She found this butterfly in her Rose of Sharon last summer, late summer, and of course she thinks it's beautiful. And I'm guessing would like to know, is there any way to get them back? Yeah, so this is an Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. So usually Eastern Tiger Swallowtails are a beautiful yellow color with the black striping on the wing veins. And the males of this species are all yellow, but females can be either yellow or they'll have this dark black phase. Um, and you know, plant flowers that attract pollinators, that's a good way to keep them back. The caterpillars of this species, they feed on wild cherry, um, basswood, ash, and willow. So if you have those types of plants around, you'll get more butterflies like That's that. That's wonderful. Thank you, Kate. All right, your last set here, Kyle. Um, this is timely. This is a Murdoch viewer. They're saying last year they had a terrible problem with cedar apple rust, and they were uh, recommended to use fun Funginex, try flooring on the trees, can't find it. Is it time to do this? Are you getting CAR in the in the in the lab and, and what are we doing about it's, cedar apple rust? Yeah, um, the cedar apple rust galls are, they're active right now. Um, especially when the, the cold snap will slow things down a little bit, but 
the moisture that we had about a week ago combined with uh, moderate temperatures, a lot of the cedar apple rust galls on campus were, were really starting to, um, to explode and kind of look beautiful and alien-like. Um, <laughs> As far as as far as control goes on your um, on your apple tree at home, the big thing to think about is how how much infection did you have last year? Generally, we don't recommend um, treating a lot of trees at home for cedar apple or for cedar apple rust. But if your tree last year had about 50% defoliation due to that disease you may want to start thinking about, about treatment of um, some sort of fungicide treatment. And now really is the time to, really is the time to be doing it. Um, not familiar with the Funginex product. Um, however, uh, Myclo, Myclobutanol um, is one of, our, one of our group three fungicides that works very well um, for controlling cedar apple rust. And you'll want to start applying, you want to start those, that treatment program right about now, but then reapply every seven to 14 days as long as the cedar apple rust galls are still active. Once we actually have the spots on the leaf, it's, it's too late to do anything, but right now is the time to, to apply a fungicide if you need to. And didn't we last year have multiple sporulation of of the galls we did yeah. so apparently um, each of those galls can release horns seven times oh. i have a couple on campus that i've been that i've been tagging i have not seen one release those horns um seven times but who knows <laughs> great yeah <laughs> nature indeed. wins on that one right yep all right elizabeth your last one here this is a viewer in omaha they, uh, he wants this vine identified because it's growing up a dead tree and they want to take that tree down. So we've heard the saying, leaves of three, leave me be. And that <laughs> goes with poison ivy. Mm -hmm. So what this viewer has is poison ivy growing up the trunk of the tree. So when it comes to treating, they're going to need to do like a cut stump treatment where they cut the vine and then they dab that root system with a product, whether it's a glyphosate product like Roundup. Um, since the tree's already dead, you might be able to, to do a pickler in product. Um, the thing to keep in mind is at any stage that poison ivy is going to contain the oils. So even if the leaves have dropped, even if the vines are dead, that is going to contain the oil. So what they want to avoid is they want to avoid burning any of that wood because even that wood from the vine is going to produce those oils as well. So um, I had somebody call and they wanted to chip it and I was like, well, you could, but that just spreads where that's at. Um, so they have to be very cautious with that. Um, there's some poison ivy blocker like products that you can put on your clothing or on your person so you don't get the oils on your skin. Once you come in, shower, cool soapy water um, to try to remove any oils that could possibly be on you. Right, and, and that sometimes can be more than a one, two, three, four times to get that vine totally killed. And they're a tough one. They are, they're not gonna be done right away. So be ready for little sprouts everywhere for a exactly. while. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. All right, uh, picture questions, or not picture questions, Kate. You have, a, you have a question from Lincoln. They live in, a, in an older house, found a wasp clinging to a window inside, caught it, took it outside, figured it had flown in but then he found another one in the same room. They're small. They were both found in a room that has house plants that spent the summer outside. And what he's wondering is, is are the wasps, have they nested potentially in the plants? And if so, would they actually hatch and come out and be swarming all over in his house? He doesn't really want wasps all over in his house. Um, I would say in this case, if you're able to send in a picture, that way we can identify what wasp it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, generally wasp nests, they're going to be visible unless they're like inside a structure. So if it came in on a house plant, you should be able to see a nest and easily remove it. I would say you might have a nest that might be above a door or a window that's been open and maybe they took the opportunity to fly in, but 
you know, as mentioned, if you could send in a picture and we could figure out what species it is, that would be helpful. All right, excellent. All right, Kyle, uh, we've had some snow mold questions mm -hmm. this year. Uh, this is a viewer from Hooper, and they, they did say they lost a big share of their lawn last year, and they thought it was grubs. Now they think it was a fungus, so they're wondering whether they should treat for it. So since they're saying last year, it's unlikely that it was snow mold. Probably, probably yeah. was not snow mold. Um, last year, uh, last year was a, it. Be really curious to know what type of lawn they have. Um, that would tell us a lot about what what diseases may potentially be there. Um, but last year, brown patch was ran rampant, um, and so if you did have a lot of a lot of fungal issues in your lawn last year. Chances are, if we have similar um, weather conditions this summer, we'll have those same those same issues in that in those same spots. So um, you probably would want to start thinking about some sort of fungicide application. All right, excellent, Elizabeth. We've had huge interest, of course, this year with all of our gardeners that we hope to keep in raised beds. Mm -hmm. So a couple of questions. Uh, one of these is from Skyler have to do with what to put in the beds. So the first the first piece of this one is, can you do things like put used tires in the bottom of a raised bed so you're not putting so much soil in the bed? And f the follow-up to that is, what kind of soil do we recommend? Because you know you can buy bagged soil that says four raised beds now. So when we put things in the bottom of the raised beds, we're going to put those things that don't release you know, petroleum products. So I would not put tires in the bottom of a raised bed. Um, if you wanted to take up room, I would put mulch. Um, reason for that, it's organic and it's going to help hold moisture unlike milk jugs and aluminum cans and other things that are plastic, they're not gonna help to hold moisture. Um, so, you know, that's where mulch will break down with time and it'll add organic matter into that raised bed. Now, when we put stuff into the raised bed, while you can, put a mixture of topsoil, peat moss or coconut core and sand, you can do that in that raised bed. Um, if you want to buy the bagged potting mix, you can. It's just going to be more costly to do so. Um, so they can add um, garden soil and add compost to it, organic matter to it. We just wanna be careful on those ratios. So we're not putting too much compost with that garden soil because then there's gonna be too much nutrients there for um, those plants in that raised bed. All right, excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. I think we have time for one more question for you, Kate, and then we have maybe one announcement tonight. This is maybe simple and maybe not. Oh, good, thanks. So people are really wondering, since it's time to plant, what, what can they do to get and attract and keep the pollinators? Yeah, so first and foremost, you know, plant flowers. We always recommend that you plant native flowers. Um, be, <sighs> That's a good question. <laughs> Plant flowers, right? Um, you know, just be wary of how you're treating your landscape plants mm -hmm. too, because you know you never want to spray potentially harmful insecticides on flowers that are blooming. Um, I don't know, Elizabeth, you have anything to add? You know, it's gonna be, are we attracting the adults? Are we attracting the larva? If we have the larval food sources, the adults will follow. Um, those are some big ones, so look up those. And then, um, you know, those spent stems and things like that can help with some of those pollinators. So those all work out well, too. All right, excellent.